Yeah. Oh, show them what you have right here. Show them. Oh, two cars. What do we have? A police car and a red truck. James has a book called Red Truck. Red what truck. is it? Red truck. Red. Not a show truck. A tow truck. Something like that. Hope you're all having a great day. Today we're going to be reviewing a poker coaching member's hand histories. I told you all to submit hand histories if you feel like it, and then I'd get to it. Please stop touching that. If I had time, and uh, well, I don't have anything prepared today, so we will be reviewing this hand history starting shortly. Before we get to that, there's a little bit of time left to get into the giveaway for the free cash. Please stop, please stop. You're gonna break this. Please stop touching the cords. Check it out at pokercoaching.com slash free cash. What are you gonna do today? You gonna go to the park? No, 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 we're gonna do it. Laundry. You're gonna do the laundry? Yeah. Yeah, I need to do the laundry tonight as well. Am I still hungover? Uh, yeah, I probably had a bit too much to drink the other day on Sunday. Now it's Wednesday, so I'm okay. Um, we'll have to chill out on that. We had a rough stream. We streamed, I don't know, 14, 15 hours. We lost about 8,000 bucks. Um, that said, my EV Big Blind per 100 was 17, which is through the roof. Anything above five in high stakes games, you gotta be really, really happy. And, um,. It was 17. <laughs> we got it in good a lot, but it did not pan out. Was Amy mad at me? A little bit. Stop Stop messing with the cords. If you don't, stop. Look, look, you have this all tangled up. If you're going to mess with the cords, you're going to have to leave, okay? Any book recommendations? Oh, you're telling me to go read that book. I, I, I read that book about uh, three months ago. Are PCP members eligible? Yes. Anyone's eligible. Doesn't mean I'm going to do it, but... um. If we have time, we'll do it. You enjoyed the wax cheese. I'm glad you all had a good time. All right, you keep messing with the cords. Tell everybody bye-bye. No. You tell everybody bye-bye. Have a good day. No. Well, you're messing with the cords. No. You're, you're going to end the stream if you don't stop that. You're one of the guys camping at my YouTube for 10 hours a day. Well, thank you. All right. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. Let's get to this. We're going to review some hand histories, okay? I have no clue what are in these hand histories. I have not seen these. I have not gone through these at all. These may be great. These may be terrible. I do not know the buy-in of this game. You would think it would tell you that on the hand history, but it does not. So let's get to it. Um, we are Buddha won't pay. Let's go over here and turn off our hand results because I don't want to ruin that. If you forgot your password, email support at pokercoaching.com. Limp, three big blinds five big blinds we have 25 um i'm just all in here every time if there's some world where obviously our heads up display stats are gonna be wrong should i kind of turn those off um show it up display okay because i only have 10 hands in port here not the whole hand history this is a spot where when it goes raise tiny all in minimum re-raise yes this could be the nuts but when you have the ace and the queen you block a lot of the nut hands oh what am i doing i'm doing the wrong thing I'm such a fish let's see no no give me a second everyone why is this not showing huh hmm 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 one minute One minute, one minute. No, that's not it, that's not it. All right, well, let's, let's try to figure this out again. You sure are hiccuping a lot today, James. Why do you think you're hiccuping so much? Why do you think you're hiccuping so much, sweet boy? All right, there we go. Here's the hand history. Okay, now you can see this. By the way, if you're listening to this on the audio format... You can't see me. Yeah, you're right over here. Um, it may be better to watch this because stack sizes are very relevant. Here we have an 18 big blind stack limping. All in for three. Min re raise to five from a big stack. This is a spot where we have an easy all in. Easy, easy all in for our 25 big blind stack. All right, James, I'm out. You got to go. Tell everybody bye-bye. I say have a great day. Okay. See ya. Have a good time.
Have a good time in the park with your friends. Love you. <sighs> used to be so cute. Now he just bangs around and tries to pull all the cords out. Such is life, I suppose. What streaming software is this? This is called XSplit. All right, so anyway, Lent from eight, 19 big blind stack, three big blind all in from the, what is this, low jack seat, button, five big blinds, and we have 26 in the big blind with ace queen offsuit. I'm just always all in. It's an unfortunate spot. I mean, yeah, the guy who's re-raising minimum is going to get you every once in a while, but I think this is still just going to be an easy all in. I mean, if we're on the bubble or something like that, I mean, I guess there's some world where we could fold. If we were on the stone bubble or somewhere in that vicinity, sure, I could get behind folding. But um, I, I don't have any information that says where we are. Is this a tournament or cash? Does that make a difference? This is a tournament. Does it make a difference? Not in this instance. Actually, if this is a cash game, I'm always all in. Every single time. If it's a tournament, um, like I've said, there are a few rare instances where I'm not all in. I would definitely not call, though. I think this is a big mistake. Calling is going to let the player on the button realize their equity very well. When you call, you pretty much have to get an ace or a queen in order to win this pot. So um, this is a spot where I, I definitely would have just jammed it all in. Ace, king, six, check, check, turns to five. I would bet small, like five big blinds. You bet 11. I hate the 11 big blind bet. This forces the opponent to play very, very well. And you don't want to force the opponent to play well. You want to force the opponent to make mistakes when you bet 11 out of your 20 big blind stack, the player on the button is pretty much only going to call with a really good draw, which they don't have because they would have bet the flop, or a really good made hand, which they probably don't have because they checked the flop, right? Every once in a while, you will be running into a slow play, ace king, or set, but this is a spot where you just have the best hand virtually every time, and your opponent is drawing very, very dead, or nearly dead. So I would bet something like five big blinds. You really don't care if they stick around in the pot. And you see the opponent folds, and whatever he folded... Probably had little to no equity. So you'd much rather bet five and then call if the opponent jams. I would call if the opponent jams. Um, and when you do bet five, you'll get called by like pocket sevens, which is clearly great because that hand's drawing very, very thin. What's the best place to start if you're a poker coach and premium member? Depends on exactly how you want to go about using the site. You can use it in various ways. We have a lot of classes. Go there, search them for whatever topics bother you. Whatever that is, say you have a problem dealing with three bets, or say you have problems with your bankroll, or say you have problems playing the river, or have problems with overbetting, whatever. Any question you have, I have a video for it at pokercoaching.com slash premium in the classes section. If there's not a video on your topic, send me an email and I'll make it for you. That's what we do. We answer whatever questions you have. We have something like 100 classes that are you know 20 to 30 minute long classes on specific topics. Also, there are a lot of courses there are a lot of tournament courses there. Some of them are hand history reviews that I played or other coaches played. Some of them are on specific things like um, heads up, no limit, hold them. So figure out exactly what you are lacking and do that. Take all the quizzes. Yeah, you can take all the quizzes. Also, um, we have the homework there. I mean, I think by far the most beneficial aspect of the site is the homework because it teaches you how to think about ranges. So I tell you to go all the way back to the beginning, start at the first one and work your way forward. Where do you find my recommendation for heads up display? You can send an email. I'll send you this. My, well, my head's up display. You can't see it now because we don't have any hands. Support at pokercoaching.com. All right. Here we have ace jack offsuit. I would min raise. You do min raise. You get minimum three bet and called. All right. Well, so here you want to ask what's going on. Um, I would generally be kind of cautious in this scenario because when it goes minimum three bet and then call, this guy who's calling may be setting you up every once in a while, hoping that you'll jam. Also, the minimum three bet could just be a really strong hand. So I would call here, but I would proceed cautiously. Now, if you have reason to believe these guys are just completely messing around, like their stats are both very, very loose, then I would just be all in the vast majority of the time. But I, I like calling here most of the time. All right, we have ace, jack, flop comes jack, 10, eight. We have a spade, there are two spades on the board. Check. Initial player bets 11.5. I would just be all in now. Uh, we are going to be running into a better hand sometimes, but even then we have some outs. So I'm just all in. Your hand's too good. It's always unfortunate when you do get called here, but your hand's too good. But it does have pocket king, so good job not um, re-raise. Let's see. 
Let's see, how many big blinds is a normal downswing over a couple of months for turn for live cash games? It depends on how much you're playing. If you're playing once a week, that's very different than if you're playing every day, right? So a month doesn't really matter. What matters is how many hands have you played. But um, I don't know, if you're down, I mean, it, it also depends on your win rate, right? Like if you're just crushing the games, you're never really gonna have a big downswing. Like whenever I used to play a Bellagio every day, I'd go and play five to no limit, went about $100 an hour, $120 an hour, somewhere in there. I had no losing months over the course of a year, zero. Um, we did have a month where we roughly broke even. There's one month where we broke even. Every other month, we just won like 20, 30, 40K. Um, but I had a very high win rate in the game, right? If your win rate is small or lower, you're going to have all sorts of swings, right? You were muted on the first webinar you joined. Well, that's because you're not the presenter. I'm the presenter. I already made a video about putting money in and out of, of websites. Search Jonathan Little, USA Poker Cash Out or something like that on YouTube, it'll come right up. Do you have any tips on how to play eight or nine handed tables? You find it more difficult. It should be way easier. It seems almost unbluffable to you. It's definitely bluffable. Just learn to play good poker. You're up $9 and 60 hours, congrats. Position, 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 that's right. If you're playing nine handed and you're playing under the gun nine handed, like you're playing under the gun six handed, you're making big mistakes. We have charts for the pre-flop ranges. PokerCoaching.com, right there in the tool section for you for nine-handed poker and six-handed poker. All right, folds are in the small blind. Um, I think this is a fine spot to limp. You could also raise. Raising and then having to fold is a little bit rough, but limp's fine. I typically limp when we start to get shallow. I would just, um, do we even bet this flop? So it comes seven, seven, three. We have queen seven playing 17 big blinds deep. I mean, look, I go for the limp bet a lot, and I think this is probably an okay spot to still go for it, even though we do have the board just absolutely crushed. I would have gone for the one big blind bet. Just because the opponent's going to have a lot of hands that have some equity, like with over cards they need to call, gut shots need to call, king of diamonds brick needs to call, right? Like, there are a lot of hands that um, I, I'm, I'm a fan of going for a small bet against. Turns a six, uh, again, bet. So I, I hate the fact that you're slow playing this super hard. Also on the turn, like there's also some pretty bad rivers, right? A diamond's not great. I mean, a diamond's fine, don't get me wrong. No, no river is terrible, but a diamond's not great. Five's not great. Four's not great. Um, and, and your opponent could just have hands that would still call a bet. I mean, go for small bets. Small bets are great. You bet small on the river, the opponent folds. Yeah, just bet the flop. And you're going to find that if your opponent drastically overfolds here with stuff like. 9-8, you're just going to run over them in general. You may say, do I even care about balance at all in this spot? And uh, maybe you do, maybe you don't. It's difficult to say. You're up money in tournaments, down in cash games. Ugh, well, that's how it goes. Did that guy just get lucky and win with ace-jack against the kings? Uh, yeah, that's okay. Sometimes you're going to get lucky. There are a lot of spots in tournaments where your hand is just too good and you're going to put your money in. And top pair in a three-bet, a weird three-bet pot with a shallow as a shallow stack, you're always putting your money in. All right, ace-king. A lot of people think that you're just going to always get your money in very, very good in poker, but that's just not true. If you're getting your money in good over and over and over again every single time, you're playing way too tight. Like right there, I, you don't love getting your money when it goes min three bet and it flops top pair on jack-10 blank, but you know, whatever. It's okay. Rad Dad Poker says you have to get lucky to win tournaments. So funny enough, you don't have to. And also it depends on what tournament you've been talking about. But, and also, like, what is lucky? You got to win some hands, I'll tell you that. You're not going to sit there and not win hands. And, um, like, is lucky just getting aces 17 times and getting it in against kings every time and winning? I mean, that's, that's lucky, right? Even though you actually had the best hand every time. A lot of people like to try to classify or quantify luck, but I'll tell you just to forget about it. It's completely irrelevant. People who complain about luck, marvel at luck, etc., are focusing on the wrong things. They are focusing on things that do not matter. And I want you all to focus on things that matter, like playing to the best of your ability. All right. Anyway, here we have 2.5 big blind raise from our hero, Ace King, playing 45 big blinds deep for us, but most of the other people are shallower. The low jacks, low jack calls off 25 big blinds, button calls, and big blinds all in for no chips. So three way. Flop, flop comes queen, eight, three. Two spades, we have king of spades. So pot's 11 big blinds. Mm, 
The problem with betting here is that if we do bet, like, let's say, four or five, six big blinds, and the button jams, we probably have to make a reluctant call-off because the button only has 17. So if we bet five and the opponent jams, we have to put in 12 to win uh, 45. So do we have 25% equity? Probably. Um, I think I'd probably just check this flop, though. We can realistically check call a small bet. This queen on the board should connect okay with both the low jack caller and the button caller. So I am going to check this and see what develops. Fernando, good morning. Check, check. Button bets 5.5 out of 16, out of 17. I would just fold. Um, if you do call here, every once in a while you get jammed by the player you get to act, which is a disaster. Also, it's not like your hand is particularly great. So yeah, I would just fold. So you like to call, and the problem is, is that your hand's going to play quite poorly on basically every turn. Because notice, you check your opponent bets. You are you need to win 25% of the time. And like on this turn, it's actually probably a call. Like now you'd rather not have the king of spades because you want your opponent to have all the spade draws. But now there actually are a lot of draws you beat, right? Like ace high flush draw, jack high flush draw, jack 10, 10, 9, right? Um, the 8 coming obviously makes you dead if the opponent does have like random 9-8. The problem though is that this is a spot where it's pretty unlikely your opponent bets the flop with 9-8. So really you're going to be against a queen or a draw here basically every time. So against a queen, obviously you're not in great shape. You have 6 outs, which you're nowhere near getting the right price. You're going to win about 12% of the time. You need to win about 25, so that's not good. But against a draw, you have what? 65, 70-ish percent equity, depending on exactly what we're against. Maybe 80 percent equity, maybe more, who knows. Um, so look, I hate this spot. I think you're behind a lot, but I, I would reluctantly call it off. And you decide to fold. And this really does show like the, the problem with check calling flop is that this turn is actually quite good for you. And it's good for you because your opponent probably doesn't have a whole lot of eights. And you still just, it's a bad spot on the turn, right? So the right play here is to just check fold flop. Alternatively, you could bet small on the flop, like bet three big blinds. I think that's a pretty sweet play with a lot of hands. Like, say you did have aces. Someone asked here, where was it? Head, motor, plus. Said mortar, plus. If you had aces, would you be tempted to bet the small on the flop? Yeah, I think betting small here would be fine. And so for that reason, maybe we bet small with a lot of our hands that have equity. And we're basically using this hand as a bluff to try to get, like, pocket sevens to fold. So I think that's certainly reasonable. Which Bitcoin wallet do you use on your ledger? Um, Ledger has a default app that you download. So go to Ledger, I guess Ledger.com or whatever it is. Make sure you go to their official site. Obviously, don't go to a non-official site. And um, you download an app. You download a, a program. I'm, I'm not. I'm certainly not the crypto king or anything over here. I'm not sure exactly what you're asking. But Ledger has a na native wallet. Is that what it's called? Is it worth opening wide ranges like Ace-8 suited and 9 suit from early position and micro stakes where you know you're going to get multiple callers? You want to get multiple callers with hands that draws the draw that flop well. That's exactly what you want to have happen. Do we have stuff on heads up? Um, there should be. S is there anything on heads up? I don't know. Send us an email. Support at pokercoaching.com. We'll find it. Let's see. What do you prefer, hot drinks or juice? Definitely not juice. We try to not drink too much sugar unless it's exactly Cabernet. Shouldn't the button be betting narrower given the big blind has a random hand that will realize 100% of equity here? Um, yeah, yeah, that's true. I don't think it's that big of a deal. But um, yeah, that, that is true. Button should be stronger because big blind is all in. That's a good point that I did not point out that I kind of ignored. Hey, do we get to see what card, how cards they have? Let's see. We do. 9-8. Wow. Opponent had 9-8 of spades. So we were dead. As you see. Just fold the flop. Someone made a review of a heads-up match on Poker Coach. There you go. So I know there's some stuff on there. If not, let me know. I'll get on there and I'll play some games. Also, watch my streams. We've, uh, we've managed to win a few tournaments on stream. So we actually have some, some hands. All right, now we're playing 36 big blinds deep. Giant stack opens from the hijack seat to two big blinds. I would definitely three bet to about 5.5. You go to 8.3, big mistake, giant mistake. The reason this is a giant mistake 
is because in this scenario, when you make an 8.3, you're basically announcing that you have a good hand. You're not putting an 8.3 out of your 35 and folding all that often. You'd much rather go to 5.5. That's going to give your opponent the illusion of fold equity. Also going to 5.5 is going to get your opponent to call kind of wide from out of position. So check that out. There's a 12-part course on heads up in the courses section. All right, great. There you go. I hate this big raise here. It really does force your opponent to play decently well. Opponent does call. You really don't expect to get called all that often here. This is where having stats is really valuable. Like if this guy's kind of tight, I would actually be very unhappy here. If the guy's very loose and splashy, though, I'd be very happy. That said, I'm always three betting much smaller in these scenarios. Um, even with bluffs, you don't mind your opponent calling and then just playing straightforwardly after the flop. Flop comes seven, six, three, whatever. We'll be all in by the river. So he checks, I bet six or seven big blinds. Again, you always want to give your opponent plenty of room to jam. You go nine. Again, I don't like this. I think this is way too big. Notice now, if your opponent does jam, pot will go up to, what, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70? So you have to put in 20 to win 70? Do you think you're ever, ever not going to call 20 more into a 70 big blind pot? I mean, if you have like ace jack here, you're probably supposed to call it off. So that would be a pretty big error for your opponent to bluff here too often or ever. So I, I would definitely bet smaller to give the, room, the opponent plenty of room to bluff. Opponent does jam, obviously you reluctantly call. Opponent has nothing, so that's fun. So seeing how the opponent has literal air ball for a6 on 7-6-3. Opponent raised preflop, which is fine. Calls your huge three bet, which is terrible. And uh, I mean, I guess once they see this flop, I guess they have to put their money in. Um, I mean, clearly it makes your play better than re-raising small. That said, I still think we generally prefer the small three bet unless we know this guy's just insane. All right, let's see. Do you encounter spots in tournament poker that you have not encountered before? Sure, sometimes. Thanks for doing this. You're very welcome. Is this cash game or tournament? This is a tournament. You're usually going to find that when stacks are less than 100 big blinds across the board, it's probably a tournament. We're viewing a tournament run by a poker coaching member. Like I said, I have no clue what's going to happen in these hands. I mean, this is another example of a spot that we're like, if we just happen to be beat, we're, we're not folding, right? Like right here, say the opponent did trap us with aces. When we, when we bet the flop and the opponent raises, we're obviously all in. We're very, 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 very happy. So there you go. But yeah, definitely you want to be three betting smaller to give your opponents room to bluff. When you make it big, it makes it hard for them to bluff. They just have to have something decent. All right, 10 big blind all in, five big blind call, easy fold here. Easiest fold in the world. I would never put a chip in. Even against just the under the gun jam, I would fold. What would I need to call here? I would need, what would I need? Ace 10 suited or better, ace jack off suited or better, something like that. Um, pocket eights, king queen suited. I think that's probably about right. Something like that. Terrible call. Terrible call. Terrible, terrible, terrible call. I don't know what you're thinking here. I'd love to know your thought process of calling here. This is not good at all. I mean, perhaps in some world you're thinking this under the gun player has a super loose range or something like that. But yeah, this is this is not a good strategy. What if big blind has seven big blinds? No, still a fold. Ace, Ace X offsuit's always going to be a fold against early position raisers. Let me show you. Well, early position jammers. So what do we think early position is jamming with? Okay, let's just give the early position player a range that, that we think they're jamming. We'll go through here, we'll select some hands. Let's presume they're jamming every hand they're gonna play. Let's presume they're even kinda loose, okay? I'm gonna make them kinda loose to make this as good for us as we possibly can. Okay, so we think this guy's jamming kinda wide. All right, this is pretty wide. This is way wider than he should be jamming. So we go over here to tools, hand range calculator, Type in, um, well, what are our pot odds? Let's get out the calculator, see how often we need to win. We have to put in, our opponent went in for nine, so we have to put in eight to win a total of our nine, our opponent's nine, small blind and ante. I'm, I'm ignoring the caller for now. So that's 18, 19.5, okay? So we need to have 41% to break even, so we probably wanna have more like 43% to profit, okay? Okay. Calculate hand range. Here's what we should call if the opponent is jamming absurd. This is what we should call if the opponent's jamming absurd, okay? 
This is like the loosest we could even possibly consider calling. Now, what if our opponent's not jamming absurd? What if our opponent's actually a reasonable human and they're jamming only good hands, as they should? What if they're jamming something more like this? Okay, run the same process again. Now you see, it starts to tighten up substantially, right? To where it's something like this. Now if the opponent is, I think this is probably what a lot of people are jamming with, but uh, you know, every once in a while you find people who are jamming even a little bit tighter than this. They're doing perhaps this number, something like this. If they're doing something like this, you see it's gonna get even tighter. So I think we're somewhere between roughly that range I just showed you to call. Oops, gotta remove this range. And um, somewhere between like this, right? Interestingly enough, fives and better still call, so maybe we need to call a little bit wider with the pairs. But like I said, ace and suitor better ace jack. I think I, what did I say? Eights, so maybe I was slightly off on the small pairs. Need to call small pairs a little bit more. So something like that. Let's see. What if it's a bounty tournament? Depends on what the bounty is, right? Let's see. A lot of people freak out late game under the gun when they're facing a huge big blind next. Sure. You have to call fives because you included fours and worse as a raise first ten jam. That's not accurate. Because just because you dominate one hand does not mean that you, you have to call. Right? So let me let me go over here and show you. Let's um, suppose this guy is jamming fours. Fours only, okay? So we dominate a hand. Now you have to call with sixes and better, right? So it's not just the fact that you're you're dominating one or two hands. You need to be dom. I mean, it, dom dominating it doesn't really matter, and I don't think it's necessarily a great um, metric to use. But yeah, obviously, as you're dominating more of your opponent's range, you have to call more often. Also, what if you needed more equity, right? If you needed a little bit more equity, then you should fold even more. Like say, in this spot, we needed 45 percent equity. You see, now we call much tighter, right? Playing your first World Series event next week. I suppose you mean. Online, if it's online, it's just a regular tournament. I wouldn't think anything different of it. It's important to realize tournaments online are all exactly the same thing. They have different structures, but that's it. This program's called Equalab. It's free. Search Equalab. You don't need Power Equalab. That's a paid program. Just get the regular Equalab. It's good to go. Okay, so anyway, easy fold with the Ace-3 offsuit. And as you see, you are dominated to death. Pocket Jacks. Folds you in the small blind against 20 big blind stack. Um, limp or raise, either one. I am I mean, so look, as we get deeper and deeper, I've started raising a little bit more. Um, I think we're having better results raising and then just barreling a lot than I am limping a lot. The problem, I mean, I guess in this spot I'm going to raise. I would raise to 2.75 or 3 big blinds. The problem is, is that really looks trappy in this spot. You do 2.5, I mean, same story. You have to understand, whenever you raise small, in this scenario, you are essentially saying, I'm gonna give you amazing odds. You need to realize 24% equity and you still can't beat me. So if your opponent needs to realize 24% equity and they still can't beat you, what does that mean? Well, that means you must have the nuts or it must mean you're really bad at poker. So uh, probably you just have the nuts, which is very, very telling. So I'm usually just raising to three across the board to just get some fold equity with my bluffs. But again, this goes back to the question of do we care about being balanced at all? Or maybe it's just completely irrelevant. I'm not sure. Would it be worth it to raise with just about anything to steal the blinds? Well, first off, you're not going to just steal the blinds very often because if you make it three big blinds, your opponent needs to realize like 30, 33% equity, whatever it is, and they're going to. So if they're going to realize 33% equity, they should call basically everything. So you're not going to steal the blinds pre-flop, but you will steal the blinds post-flop with a flop bet, turn bet, etc. Flop's pretty bad for you. You have to think the opponent would jam a lot of ace x pre flop so it's actually not as bad as it looks. I would either check or bet small. I would go smaller here if I'm going to bet. I'd bet like two big blinds. As you start betting bigger and bigger, it forces the opponent to have better and better hands. With that said, why not go five big blinds? Because if you go five big blinds, the opponent's going to fold a ton. And you're risking a lot whenever you happen to be bluffing. Terrible turn. I would just check fold this. 
I mean, I would hate it, but I would just check full turn. I realize the opponent's betting small. They're probably not betting a whole lot of 8x. They could easily have a flush. They could easily have an ace. Not that I think they have a ton of aces because they're going to jam a lot of those preflop, but they could have an ace. So I would just check fold. River's a three. I would check fold again. Guess we win. So that's fun. Opponent had king eight for a terrible turn bet. Oh, this is the kind of thing you literally never see in the high six games. But in the small six games, you see stuff like this. People just do dumb things. Like, the turn bet is atrociously bad in my mind with this in this spot because our us as heroes should be checking a lot of aces and queens that are obviously going to call every time. Like, the, in my mind, that's what I'm thinking, right? We check call an ace. We check call a queen. Check call good hearts. And, um, or maybe even check a raise sometimes. Don't call it dumb. Call it unconventional. I mean, I don't mince words here if you all know me. It's not unconventional. It's not good. Is it bad if we would have folded? It's bad because our range is going to be well protected in this. I just laid it out for you, right? If we check a lot of aces and queens here and we're not folding those, and that's going to be a load of our checking range, then the opponent really does not want to bet. Now, I'm sure the opponent was sitting here thinking, all right, I'm going to bet small and get some protection against hearts. Doesn't really work like that, though. <laughs> we don't sugarcoat it around here, LOL. Yeah, that's accurate. Um, the thing is, is like if, if we play well, if our range is well protected, this bet's terrible. Now, if our range is all garbage, like, hey, perhaps a lot of small six players, when they check the turn, they actually are checking to check fold every single time. If they're checking to check fold every single time, then um, sure, it's free to bet, right? You just win the pot every time. But we are not going to sit here and play very, very poorly. Um, that said, I think this is just a fold. If we had the heart, we'd definitely check call. That should be clear. If we had jack-jack with jack of hearts, we'd definitely check call. Um, I think we got pretty lucky here. But hey, that's true. JL doesn't... Does, doesn't fold. I, I really don't fold a ton, but sometimes it makes sense. Whenever, you're, whenever you should be dead, I'll fold. You all mentioned Maria Konnikova's book. Uh, here it is. The Biggest Bluff. Just came out recently. I got to have a preview copy, which is kind of neat. I didn't know they did preview copies of books like this. Now I have a legitimate author friend. The Biggest Bluff. It's a good book. How I Learned to Pay Attention, Master Myself, and Win. So there you go. Check it out. It's fun. Nice, fun book. Have you started reading it? Yes. I'm reading the other one by my bed. A pity copy? <laughs> no, I don't think it's a pity copy. All right. Here we have Jack-9 suited, 54 big blinds deep. I would definitely raise. I would be min-raising here every time. You do not want to make it 2.5 big blinds or bigger in this spot because even though you have a lot of chips, everyone else, well, there are a lot of shallow stacks behind you. The only player with a decently deep stack that you're concerned with is a player on the button with 46 big blinds. Obviously, player in the big blind has 125 big blinds as well, but that player, I'm sorry, player in the small blind has 125 big blinds, but that player um, is out of position, so you don't really care about them all that much. So you raise Jack-9 of clubs. Small blind does call. Flop comes king, nine, six. So take a second. Think about this spot. What would you do in this scenario? You raise high jack seat. I'm sorry, low jack seat and small blind. The big stack calls deep in a tournament. Small blind checks king, nine, six. Modern poker theory will be there for you on Saturday. Uh, here's that book. I have all the poker books. <laughs> I actually helped write this book. Helped write this book a lot. It took me like a thousand hours. It was way more work than I thought it would ever be. Um, it's a good book. Good, good, good book that'll get you good and thinking about game theory optimal concepts that matter. So here I would definitely check. I would go for an, a check because late in the tournament, you really, 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 really do not want to get raised and have to play a big pot. Here, we have a very obvious marginal made hand. There aren't even very many bad turns. Notice the club is fine, because if we get a club, um, that's fine. That's acceptable. And this is a spot where stack preservation is vitally important in tournaments as we get deeper and deeper into the tournament. Even if we are not deep in the tournament, though, I would definitely check. I would always check this spot. Why? Because if you think about this, what should a competent small blind player have in their calling range? Well... It should be a whole lot of big cards and suited connected type hands. Against the big cards, you know, we're in fine shape, but if they have the king, we're just in terrible shape. And if they do have suited connected cards, a lot of those are drawing thin slash somewhat dominated, which is fine, right? Small blind calling range is a lot of broadways. Indeed, it is. 
And, you know, the opponent could have gut shots and whatnot, but you don't really care if they draw to gut shots. And you really want to minimize the chances that you run in, that you're just putting money in poorly against the king. Getting check raised here is a disaster. Now, I'm not going to say you can get check raised all that often, but you may. And in a tournament, I think you just want to check it back, and then you have easy call down on the turn in the river. If you are going to bet, you want to bet small. So opponent checks small blind. Our hero here bets four big blinds into seven. Big mistake. I would definitely bet um, like two big blinds if I'm going to bet. As you're betting bigger, you're essentially saying you're betting with a polarized range. And the thing is, is this is not a polarized hand. This is a very clear marginal made hand. If you're going to be betting with basically your whole range, you usually want to be betting small. When you bet small with everything, you're essentially saying, I think I have a very solid range advantage and I don't significantly lack the nut advantage, which is actually kind of true here. We do have the range advantage, probably, depending on what the opponent's doing. And we also don't like the nut advantage. So betting small with everything is certainly fine, but betting big is not good. And I would just bet, I mean, if I'm going to bet in this spot, I am going to be betting with a polarized range, like good kings and better, and draws, right? So if I had jack 10, I'd be betting four big blinds here. So I like the idea of the four big blind size, assuming I'm going to be doing a decent amount of checking. Do I bet a king every time? No, not every time. It's good to make sure you protect your checking range. So we do bet four. Ooh, and we do get raised. Yes! Maximum punishment. I love the maximum punishment whenever you screw up. This is, this is actually really what you want to have happen because this teaches you a lesson. If we just bet four big blinds, the opponent folds. Fine. You know, you don't think anything of it. Instead, we bet four big blinds, the opponent raises us and puts us in a miserably bad scenario. I mean, obviously, you have to call here. You have backdoor draws. You drill a nine, you're happy. You drill a jack, you're happy. Sure is bad, though. Sure is bad. Turns a three, got bets. I mean, I would fold now. You like to call. River opponent bets 13. It's kind of unfortunate. Guy bets 13. If he jammed, I would have called. <laughs> um, when he bets 13, I think it actually becomes kind of close to a fold. Because now it seems very value heavy. I mean, look, you all know me. I just don't fold anything. All the draws missed. At least the majority of the draws missed. Would the opponent ever take this line with the majority of the draws? I don't know. We've seen these people... Um, you see these people play very sporadically sometimes. I mean, obviously I expect to see a lot of King X here. I don't think it's a good play to play King X this way, but a lot of people will. I don't know. I just always call. But yeah, we lose here a lot. We fold. I think this is actually like the worst way to play this hand. And the reason I think this is the worst way to play this hand is because notice, we put money in on the flop, trying to realize their equity. We put money in on the turn, trying to realize their equity. Our opponent bets the river. Now we don't get to realize their equity because we fold. So pretty, pretty, pretty tough spot. And the tough thing here is that we really only need to be good, what, one in... Well, what, seven, we need to be good 17% of the time, which is one in five or six, right? Are we good one in six times against a random big stack who check raised this board? When we block it, block the nine, so we're not going to run into two pair too often? I mean, probably. Can we see his hand? Nope, because we folded. If we fold, you don't get to see your opponent's hand. You don't learn anything. Anyway, you want to know how to fix this problem? I'll tell you how to fix this problem. This was a very easy hand to play. Raise preflop, check, check, flop, call, turn, call, river. Easy. Check, check, flop, call, turn, call, river. Worst case, you lose a few chips. Best case, you induce a load of bluffs. The thing is, when you bet this flop, it forces the opponent to fold all their garbage. You would much rather keep your opponent in with all their garbage, get outdrawn every once in a while, but make it to where it's impossible for you to go broke slash have to play for all of your money. Okay. Ace three of spades. Full system small blind, 26 big blinds deep. I typically limp, but you could raise. Flop comes queen, seven, five. I'd bet one. I do a whole lot of limp men betting, right? Limp men betting is great. Got to check call, turns an ace. Check, check. Rivers a queen, just check again. Right here, it's very easy for the opponent to have a queen. If the opponent has a queen, it's going to be miserably bad. Opponent could also have a seven, but if they have a seven, they're going to probably find a... Well, they at least consider finding a fold. 
if they have a five, they'll at least consider finding a fold. So yeah, I would just check again on river. It's very easy for you to be against a queen. Anytime it's very easy for you to be against a queen, you probably just want to check. That said, if your opponent's going to be very straightforward, it's okay to bet. When out of position multi-way, when you will not realize full equity, what is the minimum percentage of equity you need to realize? Oh gosh, that's a hard, that's a tough question. Say you have queen five or 20% equity and you need 15% to call. But if you still realize 85% minimum, should it be a call? The answer is yes. The thing is though, is that quite often the very bad hands only realize like 60% of their total equity. So let's say pot odds say you need to win 20%. You know you're gonna win, if it was raw equity, you'd win like 25. You may only realize 60% of that, which would be whatever, 16, 17%. So you're not quite getting it there. Should we lead this ace turn? I don't know. What draws wanna lead the turn? King high draw doesn't want to lead the turn. Got to think all the other draws would bet flop, right? Like if we had jack 10, we would definitely just bet flop, I would think. I don't know. It's tough. I mean, this is one of these spots where you have to run your whole range through Pio or try to run it through the range analyzer. 9, 8, 8, 6. Why would you not bet 9, 8, or 8, 6 on the flop? I would always, literally always bet 9, 8, or 8, 6 on the flop. We limped, opponent checked, flop comes. You're telling me you're not betting 9-8 or 8-6? I think that's pretty bad to just check call that instead of just betting it. To be fair, like I'm never, I'm literally never in this spot because I'm just limping and min-betting every single time with this hand. Because whatever, whenever you bet in this spot, your opponents just fold a lot, right? They're going to fold out all sorts of hands with, um, with some equity, like jack-8, right? You bet ace-3 and your opponent folds jack-8, that's fine. <sighs> So anyway, this is a weird spot where I don't think we actually have a whole lot of obvious bluffs on this turn, as Super and Adaptoid says here. And since we don't have very many bluffs, we probably just need to keep checking. You want me to mail you a signed copy of someone else's book? I don't have signed copies of someone else's book. Sorry. So I, I don't really, I don't really think we have too many obvious bluffs here. But again, that said, I'm not too all that studied in this spot because I'm literally never in it. Anyway, I would check River, I think, but bet's fine too. Like you can go either way. As your opponents are more and more straightforward, you should be more inclined to value bet River because they'll just always check back a seven and then, but they'll call it if you bet. Whereas um, if on the River you bet, they will call with a seven. But if they're ever going to start turning some hands into raises, like, like any unpaired hand, it becomes much, much more difficult. So I would, I would actually probably recommend betting in the small six games, but in the higher six games, I would say checking is probably going to be ideal. All right, two big blind raise, playing one, two, three, four, five, six-handed. Looks like we're at a final table. If we're at a final... So look, this is a fun spot. At this final table, I'll just lay out the chips for everyone listening here. 23 big blinds under the gun. We have 21. Cutoff has 43. Button has 124. Small blind has 30. Big blind has four. Okay? 25, 20. A lot, a lot, a lot. Four. Okay. This is a spot where when under the gun opens with 25 big blinds, you need to be very tight. Assuming we're at the final table. We're going to talk about if we're not at the final table in a second. Assuming we're at the final table, this is a very easy fold. I shouldn't be showing the opponent's cards. I guess it's too late now. The reason this is a fold is because it is highly likely this 25 big blind stack must have a good hand, right? They're raising into the tiny stack that's probably going to call from the big blind anyway, so they have to have something decent. And also, they're raising into the cutoff and the button, both of which have big stacks. They could very easily just put in the three bet and apply immense pressure to that 25 big blind medium stack. So this is a spot where under the gun, or low jack in this instance, must be very tight. If they must be very tight, how does ace jack offsuit do in your scenario? Well, not so great, right? It's actually kind of marginal. So in this scenario, I would just fold. I wouldn't even put a chip in the pot here if it's at a final table. If it's not at a final table, though, now, all that stuff I just said goes out the window, right? Obviously, the opponent's still going to have to worry about getting it all in against um, the, the big blind, but whatever. You know, if you get it all in with Jack-10 suited against the big blind random hand, who cares? So if this was not at a final table, I would be all in every time. If this is at a final table with normal payouts, I would definitely fold. So you see how there's like a big difference in those two things. We also don't want to call here. Calling would be quite bad. Because if we call, 
either one of the uh, big stacks he attacked could raise, and then we have to fold. We also don't really want to 3-bet. I mean, I guess if we 3-bet to, like, 5, we could still fold to a jam. Maybe 5.5. 5.5 could be okay, I guess. But like, this is just so nasty. If we're at a final table, because if you make it 5.5 and you get jammed, you can probably literally only call, like, aces, maybe kings. And that's not really where you want to be. So this is a spot where I would, I would just fold. You do flat. Flop comes king, jack, eight. Opponent bets four into six. I mean, you got to pay. Ooh, I would definitely not jam. Jamming's terrible. Jamming in this spot is very bad because if your opponent does have you beat, they never fold. And if they don't have you beat, they very likely will fold. Also, notice when you have the jack, you block them having queen, jack, jack, ten, etc. that could conceivably bet and then call it off. So in this scenario, usually when they bet, they're usually going to have a hand like a king, which you lose to. Or a very good draw. But notice you block the very good draws too, right? I guess I could have like queen, ten, a diamond specifically, but you're not happy about that either. So this is a spot where you have a very, very easy call on the flop and pray to check it down. In this scenario, assuming we're at a final table again, all you want to do is realize your equity. When you, well, you want to realize your equity without getting all your money in. You want to realize your equity as cheaply as possible. And when you put all your money in, it really does force the opponent to play very well and here, it's just like an easy decision, right? If the opponent has a king, they call. If they don't have a king, they fold. And given you have the jack, and given they open from the early position, and given they have a tight range, you just can't put your money in here. Let's see. If we're on the bubble under the gun, you have eight, ace, king, 18 big blinds, 8 max. Jam, raise, or fold? Um, depends on if there's really, really tiny stacks or not. If there's like two big blind stacks hanging around, you should probably just fold. Your C betting strategy, how do you define large versus small range advantage in critical points where you get small, frequent, large, and frequent strategies? Um, so this is a big topic. We're not going to discuss this, but I am making a tournament master class for poker coaching premium members, and we go through and discuss all of that. We break it down very thoroughly. Folding to is folding the flop too nitty? I think with the jack of diamond, I mean, with the ace of diamonds and the jack, I think it is a little bit too nitty. Also, the thing is, like, say this guy does have king queen here. If he bests the flop and you call, he should probably be pretty cautious himself. So this is a spot where, unless the opponent has a very good hand, it's probably going to just get checked down a lot. And when it gets checked down a lot, you know, you're going to you're going to realize your equity okay. And if the opponent does keep betting the turn, that's fine. They they probably just have something very good that has you in bad shape. Unless they have, like, exactly queen 10 of diamonds or 10 9 of diamonds, right? So this is a big, big mistake. What do you think of bet 2.5 pots? Three? Marcelo, I'm not sure what you're saying. Uh, but yeah, I think folding flop would be a little bit too nitty. That said, easy fold preflop. I really do want to harp on this because this is important. So it seems like we've had a few errors here where Budo won't pay has done a few things that are just like a little bit too loose. A lot of the, a lot of the errors were just a little bit too loose. We'll go back through them really quickly. But like right here, this is just too loose. Given it, assuming we're at a final table, just, just fold because you really want to outlast this three big blind stack and it's kind of free to do that. Um, if we are not at a final table, it's just an all in. You don't want to be splashing around. So anyway... We do jam, opponent clearly calls, we lose. Okay, let's go back to these hands, and I want to really highlight whatever errors we can find here. Ray, limp, three big blind all in, five big blind, I said we should jam, right? You called. Two call happy, this hand and the previous hand. You just, just need to jam here. Next spot, uh, this hand was fine. Next spot, you slow played to death for no reason. Don't slow play. Slow playing is usually bad. Not always, but usually. Next hand, you called again, way too wide. So you're just like splashing around too much. Yeah, Buddha won't pay. No, Buddha will pay. Buddha seems to be an extreme calling station, but in a very weak, passive manner. Next hand, uh, you three bet too big. Don't like that. Next hand, you called with the ace three also against under the gun jam. Absolutely not. Unacceptable. Next hand, uh, you called it again in a spot where I would have folded turn, you, and you ended up winning the pot, but I think this is just a fold on the turn against anyone who's halfway competent. Jack nine suited. You elected to bet. I would definitely not bet this flop. I'm glad you submitted all these hands, because all these are ones where we would have played differently. Here. Hand's basically fine. And then the last one. So... What's the proper size of a queens when you want to three bet off a 30 big blind stack? They make it two, you make it like 5.5 out of your 30. When you make it eight out of your 30, 
it just becomes clear that you have no fold equity. Your opponent has no fold equity. This session should be a game changer for Buddha. I would hope so. I mean, that's what I'm trying to do. I want all of you to submit your hands. Oh, look, I'm not going to guarantee I'm going to go through them, through them, so don't be annoyed if I don't even send you an email back. But I'll do this every once in a while. And, I mean, this kind of thing is good. I mean, what happens is whenever I take on students like this, we'll have a session like this where student gets barbecued a little bit, and then they get better. Next time they'll submit 10 hands again, they'll get three or four of them wrong. They'll submit again, they'll get one or two of them wrong. They submit again, they get one wrong. They submit again, they get none. They submit again, they get none. They submit again, they get none. They get none. And over the course of like just four or five, six sessions like this, with private students, they go from having lots of errors to relatively few errors. And some of these errors here are actually very substantial and they're frequent. Like there's spots that come up a lot, right? If there was no three big blind stack, what would we do with this ace jack? Um, again, it depends on the other stacks at the table, right? Also depends on what this guy is doing. If this guy is... Um, tight in general, I would still just fold, assuming everyone had like 20 big blinds, but the default then becomes all in the vast majority of the time. So Buddha won't pay. Let me know. What do you think about this? What do you think about this? This review? Let me know. Been super helpful. Well, I'm glad to hear it. That's exactly what we're going for. Go back, rewatch it, etc., etc. In a lot of videos, you encourage a larger 3-bet than 5.5, right? Yeah, when you're, shot, when you're deeper stacked. We're not deep stacked here, though. It's important to understand stack sizes are very important. Do you go through cash game hands? I'll do whatever you guys want to do. Guys and ladies. I'm not trying to be sexist here. Um, so, yeah. You just remembered it was a little coffee today. It makes me scared. Do I have something else on my calendar today? No, I have nothing on my calendar today. Okay, good. Just bubbled a tournament with ace queen. The opponent had king nine and busted you. Well, such is life. Enjoy it. Enjoy the experience. Understand that the king nine wins, whatever it is, 38% 30, of the time. So I'll tell you what, if you all want me to review hands, submit me 10 hands and type in ALC review. Don't type me an essay. I don't want to read an essay. I want 10 hands that are good, interesting spots. Send them in. Maybe I'll review them. Maybe I won't. If I get 100 of them, obviously I'm not going to review all of them. But if I get, uh, you know, two or three, we'll review them over that course. You know, maybe we'll do this once a week if you all like this kind of thing. What's the best way to record your play? Get it into Hold'em Manager. If you can't get it into Hold'em Manager, I probably am not going to review them because this is easy. You see here, I don't have to do anything fancy. I suppose if you want to enter them into my replayer, Easy Hand Replayer, you can. That'll work too. And Buddha did what you're supposed to do. You tried to pick hands where you were, was not sure how to play them. That's exactly perfect. Do you have to be a poker coaching member? It certainly helps. If you like this video, well, click like, click subscribe, click share. You admire my work ethic. Thank you. I do my best. The secret to having good work ethic is to love what you're doing and to not dread what you're doing and to want to do what you're doing. I hear some people talk about they wake up and they're just like, paralyzed because they don't want to get up and do their work because they hate their work. I wake up and I'm like, all right, little coffees today, 9 a.m. Let's go. Let's do it. Should the hands be from the same tournament? No, it doesn't matter, Louis Philippe, whatever you want to do. It's up to 10 hands. We can get through 10 hands in about an hour. Seems to work pretty well. You work so hard. You all don't know how hard I work. I don't feel like I work hard. I feel like I enjoy it. I'm making this tournament course. It's hard. Let me show you what I'm doing. Oh my gosh. What a what a mess this has been. Let's see. This is all very rough at the moment. So um, playing the flop. Let's go down here. Slide 152. Um, so, for example, what do we do here? Under the gun plus one raises. You call from the big line. Flop comes. Nine, seven, five. You check under the gun plus one bet 67% pot. What do we do? How do we play our entire range? So I'm going through here. And I'm dealing with all of these, right? Explaining how to play every single hand. Then we show the GTO solution and compare it and see what does the JL strategy look like compared to the solver. Notice here, solver likes raise 5%, call 56, fold 38. So fold 38 will hopefully be somewhat consistent. Sure enough, it is. Looks like I'm raising a touch more, but that's fine. So that's good. Here's another spot. Same flop, except for now, button versus big blind. Here's a flop. What do we do? Facing the same bet. 40% fold. 20% raise. Ooh, that's a lot. 
So again, roughly same number, so that's good. If you like to see that. And then we go through all sorts of spots. Well, I'll just pull this over here and show you. All sorts of spots. Let's see, some of you were asking about the flow chart earlier, roughly about the flow chart. Here's roughly the flow chart. I don't know if you can see this. Here, I'll make it, eh, I'm not gonna make it big. So whenever you're facing a bet, how should you proceed? We have a flow chart here that explains generally what you should do. We're gonna have to edit this, it's not fully finished yet. But um, anyway, tournament course is coming along. Short stack saw roar. Yeah, that's down here in the 20 big blind section. Where is it? Well, we haven't done it yet. Do we have the solutions yet? We sure need them, I need to get to that. Four bet pots as a three better in position when facing a bet. Yeah, anyway, this has been a slog. Uh, this this currently has, uh, oh, you know, 500 slides for the post-flop section, <laughs> pre-flop section, or all the other sections. Goodness, what do the other sections have? That's not it. Anyway, it has like a thousand slides. It's been a mess. It's been very big. We're going to start uploading the beginning of the tournament course for all of you soon, though. Is Michael Acevedo one of your coaches? He is. Mm -mm -mm. What's the normal loss expectation and normal variance? Like two buy-ins for every five to six sessions? I have no clue what you're even asking, Kevin. Should you be worried about AI will kill online cash games? Um, I mean, cash games are going to get killed before tournaments, that's for sure. Can you make a video on three to four bet pots? I am very confident I have something about that at pokercoaching.com in the homework or in the classes. All right. You want to bet with Justin? Nice. Hope you all have a great day. Hope you enjoy yourselves. You called an all in bet with aces. Okay. He, his, uh, his opponent had the 6-4. He asked him why he went all in the 6-4 because his, opponent, his wife likes that hand. All right, great. Good logic. That's going to be it for today. Hope you enjoyed this. If you did, let me know. If you want to submit hands, let me know. I have to get this camera, camera set up properly. We'll get that set up later. Enjoy yourselves. Have a great day. We're giving away some free cash. Check it out at pokercoaching.com slash free cash. That will be um, given away very, very soon. You saw an interesting hand. Ace is open under the gun. King's flat. Small blind flat's 9-7. Flop comes 8-6-5. Everybody has the nuts. Small blind checks with the nuts under the gun. And button go crazy. Small blind gets them with a straight flush. Yeah, well, when you have over pair plus flush draw, you're usually pretty happy. We'll be back again on Friday. Bright and early, 9 a.m. Eastern time. You can tell I don't write, like reading long sentences. Yeah, I don't like reading long sentences. I am a big fan of short, concise, good, clean information. I do not want an essay. I lack patience. I think online poker really ruins people's patience. And um, that's important to understand. It's important to realize what you're good at, what you're not good at. And ideally, you tell people who interact with you what you like and what you don't like. You have said you started playing Limit. Have you written anything about Limit? No, Limit Hold'em is essentially a defunct game. Um, I always, always, always suggest my students learn a game with a future. And if you want to look at a game that has been in steady decline, Limit Hold'em is a beautiful example of that. Now, I have nothing against Limit Hold'em. I like playing Limit Hold'em. I played Limit Hold'em uh, last time I was at Borgata. I hated every second of it. I lost every hand. <laughs> but um, Limit Hold'em is a game that is just not all that popular. And you also can't really make a ton of money from it. You can make one big bet per hour or something like that, which is fine if you're playing medium to high stakes, but the problem is, is medium to high stakes games don't run. So you're going to end up making like 10 bucks an hour, which is fine. Don't get me wrong. Nothing wrong with it, but it doesn't really have a future. And I always try to teach my students things that can result in them making $100 an hour anywhere in the world, right? If you can just go find any casino with a 2-5 or a 5-10 game and, um, you know, you can sit there and you put in good volume and you game select well, you'll, you'll be able to win very, very good money that actually starts to become kind of life-changing. And I'm not trying to teach you all to make $10 per hour as a, a good success rate. I'm trying to teach you all to make $100 an hour or more as a good success. So that's why I don't focus on things like that. And also it's important to realize that if you specialize on things, that's where you really get paid in the world. Uh, you don't really get paid by being a 
jack of all trades and a master of none in today's society. You get paid immensely, especially in competitive environments like poker, by getting very, very, very good at one specific thing and then just doing it over and over and over and over and over again. And um, generally, you probably want that to be the game that is most popular. Is game selection one of the keys to making money? Um, yeah, you want to play in games you can beat, clearly. If you don't play in games you can't... If you don't play in games you can beat, then you're going to lose. Do you open and raise ace-2 to ace-6 offsuit in early position? No. No, never raise ace-2 to ace-6 offsuit. Unless you're on some weird bubble scenario. All right, have a great day. Enjoy your day. Click like, click subscribe. Go to pokercoaching.com slash free cash. You have a few more days to get in that, I think. Check out pokercoaching.com. We have lots of good content there for you. Have a great day. Enjoy yourselves. Bye-bye.